and we're rolling. So this is pretty exciting. This is the uh, first episode of the podcast I'm rolling out. And basically the podcast is going to be about, well, the podcast is called Growth Without Hacks. And really, I want the focus of this podcast to really highlight some of the marketing tactics that work in the B2B space and kind of to show you that any tactics that are like flashy or like quick wins really aren't usually the best ways to go about things. And really the main focus that you want to put into your marketing is always going to be foundational, just best pra best practices, just doesn't need to be anything flashy. And for my first episode, I have here Jacob, who is kind enough to let me test out this podcast with him. And I really appreciate him jump, uh, coming on here. So thanks again, Jacob. Likewise, dude. It's my pleasure. I'm not a big podcasting guy. It's only my second one, but I'm happy to be here, dude. Yeah, this is my, also my second podcast too. Like I did a, a guest appearance on another show, but this one will be my, I guess, first one running a podcast and also second appearance. So I guess for the podcast itself, before we really get into things, I just want to, I, I have a question to kick things off. And basically I just wanted to ask, so you told me that you're living between Baltimore and DC. So my question is, which area do you prefer the food in? Baltimore or DC? And why is it Baltimore? Oh God. No, I don't even, I stay away from Baltimore, which this is a controversial question for me to get into. First question, but I do prefer DC. It just has more options and I'm not a big American city guy. I prefer European cities. Dude, I haven't been to Baltimore in years. I try to stay away from that place. So sorry <laughs> anyone. That, I love the Baltimore Ravens though. I just don't like oh, there you go. I will say the crab cakes there are, are like so good. I will say though, I went to DC and I had uh, beignets and it was like the best beignets I've ever had in my life. So if you ever get a chance, highly recommend it. Yeah, that's probably why it's not my favorite. I'm kind of an outcast in my family. I actually don't like seafood, which obviously that's what Maryland's known for. It's crab. Blue uh, that makes sense. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't really fit into like the stereotypical Marylander as far as food goes. I'm pretty picky. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, just wanted to, to ask just to, I was kind of curious about that one. So I guess just to kind of introduce Jacob here, Jacob is the founder of Stat Digital. They're an SEO focused content marketing agency, primarily working with B2B brands. So really I just, the point of this podcast is just to talk to him about what his strategy looks like, what he sees with his clients and just best practices that he is implementing with his clients. So I guess to kick things off with the actual question, do you want to tell us about how you first got into SEO and content? Yeah. I could probably make an entire podcast just about that question, but I'll give you the short summary. And I'm going to try not to go into my life story too much because it's very tied to my life story in the past five, six years. So I actually didn't go to college. I worked in a gas station right after high school and I was considering going to college, didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I didn't want to go in debt, debt to figure out things along the way just didn't seem to make a lot of sense for me. I always wanted to be a business owner. So I was working at the gas station for about a year and my friend, Jacob T. Weiner, which you should follow him on LinkedIn. He's a great guy and he's very smart and intelligent. He started an SEO agency while I was going to Towson university and he's getting sick of college. He's telling me that he was going to drop out, do his SEO thing and then travel around the world, especially Europe and kind of figure grow his business as he does that. And we were talking on the phone one night and he was telling me he felt lonely basically. And he's like, dude, you should just quit your job and come travel with me and start trying to do freelancing. And I was like, dude, I don't even like, I don't know anything about SEO. I don't even like writing. I always hated writing in high school, probably cause it was super boring and formal. And that's kind of how they train you to be. So I said, screw it. <laughs> we ended up traveling around Europe for four or five months. And I started getting my first clients on Upwork and I was making really not good money. It was like four cents a word, but it was enough to get by in travel around Eastern Europe where the cost of living was lower. So I decided I want to increase the value that I could provide to my clients. So I was like, Hey, I should probably learn SEO. If I'm writing these blog posts, I need to learn more about SEO so I can provide more value. I can raise my prices. So I basically binge watched a lot of Brian Dean's videos and read as many of the Backlinko blog posts as I could, which yeah, I, I used to be a big fan of Backlinko and Brian Dean. 
And then I started offering content strategy to my clients and turned it more into an agency model where I had writers working under me. And that's basically how I got to here today. So I started off as a freelance writer and just gradually learned more about SEO. So I could actually help my clients get customers as opposed to just delivering them blog articles. I feel like that's definitely, I mean, I always appreciate people who go that route because I, I worked at one of my previous agencies. We actually had an intern who never went to college. They were homeschooled. And I mean, the, the owner really liked her personality, really liked, I guess, the drive that she had behind her. No previous marketing experience, but she, through that internship, she was able to at least get some experience. Well, I'm sure the position didn't pay much, but with that experience, she was then able to move to another agency, build up more experience, move to another agency, get even more experience. And I mean, she didn't even have to go to college for it. She didn't have to pay like thousands of dollars for an education. And basically right off the bat, she was good with the job. I will say from my end, especially going to college, I feel like when I was at college, I didn't learn anything about SEO. Like I, I went to college for marketing and they didn't t teach me about SEO. So I kind of landed in there by chance. And really, if I could have done the route that you did and in this intern, I would have 100%, 100% have done it. So I always respect people who go that route. That is something that I've thought about in retrospect. Obviously, I was pretty much winging it. I didn't really have a clear path. Obviously, I do now because I've been doing it for so long and I've learned the ropes of trying to grow an agency, freelancing, having my own business, learning more about marketing. But I do wonder if I could have ramped up quicker if I actually worked with an SEO agency which it seems like that's kind of how you learned most of your stuff with SEO, or at least how you got into it. And obviously you're quite popular and it's going pretty well for you. So I think that would probably be the smarter route if I had to like give my 19 year old self advice, but no regrets as of now. It's definitely can be awkward when you're trying to talk to older people where everyone says you should go to college, but I've learned to be more secure mm -hmm. in my decision basically. Yeah. And I, I will say too, especially like, cause I've only really worked at market or at SEO agencies. I haven't really had an in-house role before. I and mean, the thing about SEO agencies is you really get thrown into the fire when it comes to learning, like you're managing the SEO campaigns, you're managing communication with clients. So it really, it's basically trial by fire. It's the best way to like throw yourself into the fire and just learn as quickly as you can. And I will say, especially with an agency where you're working with senior SEOs, that's the best way to, to learn from them with their experience and kind of showing you how most campaigns should be run. But at the same time, I also will say that most SEO agencies and most agencies in general are very chaotic in how you learn and just how you operate in the day to day. So while I did find it to be a good learning experience, it was very chaotic for the most part. Yeah. I got to ask you a question about that actually. What path do you think you would take if you could go back in time with everything that you learned? Like, what would you recommend to your younger self? Oh, that's a good question. I feel like the podcast was, you flipped the script on me, <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I mean, if I had to, I didn't want to do that, but uh, like, I feel like that'd be a great thing for everyone to hear. No, that, I want to hear. That was a great question. Honestly, I feel like if I were able to take a, like, if I went back, like back to the start, I think the route I would probably take is the route of the intern that I was talking about. Like if I knew I would go to college and like my degree wouldn't really transfer into actual like job skills. I mean, there were, I, I did, there were some takeaways that I kind of applied to my job, but overall with SEO, there really wasn't much there. So I think for me personally, and for other people looking to get into the marketing space, if you can get an internship, just get your foot in the door, whatever way you can, like wrap up or rack up some type of portfolio, rack up your resume, and then continue to build from there, you're going to save yourself over a hundred thousand dollars. You don't have to go into debt. You can save that money. So that's probably the route I would go honestly, is to start as an intern at an agency. Once I find the agency life is being too chaotic, I would probably move to in-house and then maybe from there move to consulting. But honestly, the route I've gone just with going from agency to consulting, I, I've been pretty, pretty happy with that route too. I like that. It helps you kind of have a mentor and a network to start off with, which is like one of the biggest downsides of doing the type of start that I did is having mentors and people that can like help accelerate you is a huge advantage. And I had friends that were entrepreneurs, they're doing SEO stuff and they definitely helped me a lot. But if I was able to 
learn from someone sooner about how to run a successful agency. I think that would have helped me a ton. Sure. Yeah. And I think especially, I mean, since you run your own agency, I think really throwing yourself in the fire is the best way of learning. Like I think if you have a mentor, they'll be helpful in your early stages, really to learn the foundations of SEO and the things that you should be focusing on and how to approach most projects. But I think really once you get into the actual like execution of the work, if you're doing it yourself, you usually end up uh, learning pretty quickly. I think that's kind of why I've appreciated agency work compared to in-house work, where with in-house, it can be pretty limited to that specific company. But when you work at an agency, again, really just throwing yourself into the fire, really have to adjust to each client that you're working with. And no campaign is ever going to be the same. So I think, yeah, I think usually in that case, that's the best way to go about learning. No, I was just going to say, for me, my learning experience has been with my clients trying to turn each client into a case study and take it from, take it as a learning experience. Then once you actually start getting results, you figure out what actually is working, what you should focus on. As opposed it's to funny you like mentioned that. a Moz article on SEO and then like basing how you're going to service your clients based on that, which we can get a little bit more into what actually matters a little bit later. But I feel like if you're, doing SEO very traditionally, you're going to end up wasting your time a lot of it with a lot of things. Hopefully and I, I like what you said about, I like how you said that you treat every client as a case study. That's actually, I was talking with my business coach, coach Ed Deason, and that was honestly word for word, exactly what I said about my clients too. Like the, basically all of them, the reason I want to prioritize them is because I want to see them as a case study. It's like a incentive for me to help them grow and really be able to show the value of that project. So I think that's definitely a great way of wording it. And I think I like the set, the second part that you mentioned too, where really, I think it was, do you know who Bill Gall is? He posts a lot on LinkedIn, it's Irish guy. Me. Yeah. That, I know who you're talking about. Yeah. He said basically what you were saying, but he described it as if you're re like, if you're trying to learn how to ride a bike, like you're not going to read a book on learning how to ride a bike. Like the only way you're actually going to learn to ride a bike is just by falling and getting up again and trying. And really the, in the sense of SEO, that's going to mean with either working on your own website, working on your client's website. And I mean, that's personally how I think I was able to learn the most when it came to SEO is really by testing out my own website, testing out my client's websites and just seeing what works and what doesn't work and what doesn't work. We can just scrap it and focus on the things that actually do work. Yeah, exactly. So the next question that I have for you, kind of going back to, I guess, just to learn a little bit more about you. So I know that you mentioned that you mostly work with B2B companies. Is there a specific type of B2B company that you either work with the most or prefer working with? Yeah, definitely. It could probably be more niche, but for the past few years, it's pretty much been all B2B SaaS companies, some PLG, some SLG. But the one thing that they all have in common is they have really small marketing teams. Sometimes they might not even have a marketing team and they're just using me as their SEO and content team basically. So usually it's like fewer than five marketing employees, but sometimes none. Sometimes some of my clients I've even worked with some bootstrap founders don't really have many marketing resources. Yeah. And I, I will say too, like, cause I, I also primarily work with like B2B SaaS companies and the reason I like love working with them is because they actually have internal marketing teams that you can work with. I found with like local companies, like most times you're dealing with the actual like owner of that company. And I found when you're trying to communicate results to them, it's not as easy to transcribe it into their language. Like basically the only metrics that they're going to go off of is why isn't the phone ringing? Why am I not getting more business? Whereas if you're working with an actual marketing team, then they're going to be a little bit more realistic about what you're able to achieve. I mean, they're going to know how to look in Google Analytics. They're probably going to have tracking set up. So it's going to be a lot easier to report on the metrics that you're you're trying or you're trying to move the needle for and not just why aren't why am I not getting more calls? Yeah, that's actually a good point. The easiest SEO clients you're going to have are people that already understand the value of SEO. You're not going to have to like explain every single thing to them. And chances are it's going to be really a hard sell for those people that don't yet understand SEO and in tech people already sure. know what SEO is for the most part. There's still skeptics out there and there might even be 
a growing audience of SEO skeptics with the way that Google's been changing with AI from the past year and a half. But I forget what point I was trying to make, but yeah, definitely agree with you there. But one thing I will say about local businesses, I don't work with local businesses, but the agencies that I know that service local businesses, they're able to scale a lot easier because they have a larger market that they can sell to. The contracts are usually smaller, but they're able to do the same thing repeatedly over and over again for a client. And that's just a more scalable process. Like I, I work with B2B SaaS companies, but it, sometimes it could be a hospitality tech company. It could be a sales tech, marketing tech. It could even be like a software development app. It varies. And that's probably one of the hardest parts about working with SaaS companies and in general. Yeah. And I, I will say too, that's actually, I mean, most people are probably going to tell me I'm crazy for saying this, but that's actually why I prefer working with SaaS companies. When I was working at my previous agency, um, most of the work was going to be, was focused on local businesses. So worked with a lot of lawyers, worked with a lot of like home service clients, like roofers, electricians. And really the thing I didn't like about them is it was the same strategy over and over again. Like location page after location page saying the same thing over and over again. The only thing that's really changing is going to be the, the actual like town that you're targeting. When you're working with a B2B SaaS company, the strategy is always going to be different. Like if you're working for an HR tech product, their content strategy is going to be entirely different than a company that does like supply chain analytics. So, I mean, it, it requires a lot more psychology to figure out like what's going to be the best content strategy for that specific client. But I think that's something I prefer is just having some like uniqueness in my day to day and not just doing the, the same thing over and over again. Yeah, that is, that sounds really mind numbing and I am thankful about that. It's definitely <laughs> harder to scale when you have tech clients and in different industries, but I will say the works I've never served local businesses, but based off what you said, I can tell you, it's probably a lot more enjoyable <laughs> if you're like actually pretty passionate about what you do and you're not just trying to have like a super scalable business, which there's nothing wrong with that either. Sure. Yeah. Either, either one works pretty fun. So I guess th that kind of leads into my next question that we talked on uh, a little bit earlier. I just wanted to talk about, so when it comes to the companies that you're working with or the industries that you serve, what are common issues that you really see these companies getting wrong when it comes to SEO and content marketing? Yeah, so that's a great question. And that's really where I try to focus in my positioning. I feel like in the past, SEO has all been about like checkbox marketing. Like, are you targeting this keyword? Do you have a meta description? Do you have alt tags? Are you building backlinks? And people get so caught up in the like the check boxes that you have to check that they forget about the, the long term goal of Google in general, which is to provide a good user experience and satisfy search intent. So people kind of get lost in their own sauce and they end up focusing on short term tactics, which there's a ton. When you focus on short term tactics, you're kind of just manipulating the Google algorithm instead of actually focusing on the user experience, which is where most of your efforts should be. For example, I don't want to dunk on backlink builders too hard, but I think it's pretty obvious they are becoming less valuable than they used to be. Backlinks used to have more of an effect on rankings. And I think it's actually for the best that they don't because anyone can do outreach and leverage their partnerships just to get artificial backlinks, which are supposed to be a vote to Google that, hey, this page should rank higher. That's one example of short-term tactics. And basically, like I said, they end up neglecting the user experience and what is going to, what's the number one factor that's going to determine whether you have a good user experience. It's going to come down to your content. And there's some other user experience things that aren't exactly content, like having an easy to navigate website, but that stuff is pretty simple in my opinion. So I think most of their efforts should actually be in creating content. Not to say like if you're starting a website from scratch, just start publishing a blog post and trying to have really good content. You should have the foundation set up, which isn't something I normally focus with my clients. Usually the clients we work with, they already have their website together and they have landing pages. And as long as they're not failing like a page speed insights test, then I'm not really going to make too many technical SEO recommendations for them. It's mainly the focus is going to be having content, 
with good messaging, good positioning that actually has a chance of reaching people that are in market ready to buy. And for those companies that you did mention where they have this, this short-term mindset on hacks, which I'm glad you brought that up because that is the that is what I'm hoping the point of the podcast will be is shifting away from that focus on like those hacks, what we could do to anything we can do to grow and avoiding focusing on what actually will help us grow. So I guess my question here is for those companies that have that short-term mindset, what different type of approach should they take to change their mindset on these strategies? Yeah, that's a good point. A good question. So like I said, they're neglecting their content, but I think it's probably good to call them out on how exactly they're neglecting it. Usually I see two different types of scenarios. One is they might not have the in-house power to do the SEO stuff and create content. So they're going to end up outsourcing their SEO and content to maybe it's an agency, maybe it's a freelance writer. And a lot of times that contractor they're going to end up creating pretty half-assed content. There's no really better way to say it because that's what I see most of the time. And I'm sure you've probably know that as well, especially since you've actually worked internally at some agencies. I don't know how their content quality was, but most agencies are pretty bad at creating content and they end up either now they're going to overly rely on AI or they're just going to hire a cheap freelance writer that's going to regurgitate information on Google, turn into an article, and they might have some SEO best practices built in, but the, the content's it's not going to be better than what's already ranking, and that's one way to fail. And the other is for companies, sometimes they will do it in-house, and they might, they're going to have in-house markers that really understand their product and their ICP, and they might even be really good at creating pretty high-quality content. Maybe they're a talented writer, but a lot of times, they don't have time to keep up with SEO best practices. So they might create good content, but they're going to make some minor mistakes. They're going to shoot them in the foot when they're trying to rank on Google. Like, for example, I see a lot of in-house marketers. They end up creating really short content, which by short, I mean like a lot of times they'll just pump out blog posts. They're like 500 words with this massive title. It's not even targeting a keyword that's important. And yeah, that stuff's pretty simple. But if you have really good content, but you're not actually optimizing it for search, they're going to fail too. I might have gotten away from your question a little bit. What no, I mean, I, I did think that was helpful. So the you did pretty much answer the question. It was basically just what, like how these companies should change their mindset when it comes to just like SEO and content in general, like moving away from any short-term tactics they can do to like scale traffic or like anything they think is like, like a short-term mindset compared to focusing on SEO, which is really just a, a long-term mindset. And I think one of the things that you brought up well was your point on AI content, which, I mean, I've been seeing everywhere recently. And it was actually funny because at my last agency, I mean, the content they created was okay, but there came a point when ChatGPT first rolled out, they were like, oh, wow, we can start using this instead of all of our writers. Like we can use this for all of our clients. And I think that was kind of like the switch moment in my head where I was like, oh no. But I, I think you kind of nailed the point well too, where you have like a blend between the outsourced agencies where they know the type of content that they should be creating, but they don't have the actual like product expertise to create like worthwhile content. So it ends up just being like regurgitated from everything else that's on the SERPs. But then you have the other side of the product marketers or the in-house team where they understand the product, but they just don't know what they should be doing when it comes to SEO. They, they're like so close to having that perfect content, but they just can't nail down how to get that content ranking. So really from what I've seen is like finding a balance between the two of, I, I, it's so conflicting, but I usually advise clients that you don't want to over-optimize your content, but you also don't want to under-optimize it too. Really, you want to get the reach from SEO, but at the same time, when that traffic lands on that page, you want that traffic to do something. You don't want them to just come to the page just for the sake of traffic. You want them to actually engage with the content that you have. So I think that's, from my perspective, something that I really hope will be changed in the coming months. Yeah. I mean, I think the hardest part about if you're creating content that you want to get customers from SEO, the one thing you can't avoid is your content has to be better than what's already ranking. So there's not very many shortcuts. If you actually want to have the best content for it to rank on Google, there's not very many shortcuts you can take 
to do that. Like you're not going to be able to more shallow content, but it's still okay. And you're not going to be able to just add some SEO optimizations to automatically get it ranking because it just doesn't work like that. And Google's getting, getting smarter and the bar for mediocre content has definitely been raised because chat GPT is better than maybe I'll piss off some freelance writers, but lower value freelance writers. So if you're watching this, you're not a low value freelance writer, but there's definitely a lot of <laughs> those out there that used to make, make money from writing. But now ChatGPT is actually better than pretty much any cheap writer. So anyone can create an article with ChatGPT. And I uh, forget where I was going with that, but I do like your point. So basically you can't take any shortcuts, although there are some shortcuts, although probably wouldn't call them shortcuts. I'd call them low hanging fruit, but I did forget to answer your question actually on how to actually fix the problem which I would like to get into a little bit. So basically what you actually need to be doing, there's strategy and then there's content creation. I think strategy, if you know what you're doing, you're pretty much going to be able to run the same playbook at pretty much any B2B SaaS company. Like me and you, we know what topics are actually going to generate revenue. So if we get a new client, we already know what topics they're going to need. It just might change based on their industry and category. But then the most time consuming part is actually creating the content. And we already talked about how people cut corners doing that, but there's a lot of different ways that you can go above and beyond with your content to actually beat out the competition, have a better user experience. At the end of the day, your content has to fulfill search intent better and quicker than everyone else. There's that you need good content formatting that's going to make your content skimmable so people can actually find the information they're looking for because most people are searching. They want quick information. They don't want to read your brand story that's 200 words in the intro before they figure out like what is a sales CRM or something like that. And then visuals, those are pretty easy to do, but probably the hardest is actually getting unique insights that are based on real experience. And that's where subject matter expert interviews are going to come from if you're if you don't have the insights yourself sometimes you might have experts in your company that you could interview to get those insights from but you don't want to skip that because that's probably the best way that you could actually have more insightful content than everyone else is actually getting insights examples and stories that are actually from people that were in the trenches sorry i didn't mean to go on a a rant there, but I wanted to make sure I answered that question a little bit better. No, I was going to say that was a great answer. And especially that last point about like interviewing a subject matter expert or interviewing someone who's in-house, I'll say anytime I'm helping a client, like create any type of piece of content, I almost always will go to their, either like one of their customer success teams, a demo team, like anyone who's like client facing or really understands the, their ICP or their client. And I'll basically just tell them what the topic is and then give them a few questions that will kind of help beef up the, the content that we want to create. So like, can you give me insights on this topic? How is it relevant to your audience? Is this something that your solution is able to help out with? And really, I, I love that approach because not only are you actually getting u uh, unique insights there, you're not only just relying on the SERPs to get your information, you're actually providing something of value within your content. So it's a nice way to like kind of include something new and not just repeating the same thing over and over again, which for some reason, a lot of SEOs, like you were talking about, think that's the the only way to go about things is just copy what's out there and just whatever you create, it's just going to be the same thing and you're going to hope it's going to rank. But I think one of the questions that I did have, which was planned for later, but I'm glad you brought it up is, so you mentioned about like having a heavier focus on UX in content. So I was just curious, like what that process usually looks like when you guys are creating content, like kind of like how you blend the two and figure out like what an article needs, like whether it's images, videos, or just like different insights that you want to plug into the article. Right. And we did start to get into a little bit about like ways you can actually improve the user experience. So I don't want to repeat myself too much there, but you want to get to the satisfy search intent. Like why are people searching? You want to give them their answer as soon as possible and give them the information they're looking for. It should be easy to find. And um, I'm not sure if there's too much I could add there. Although we could definitely go more in depth with any of those like many subtopics about like how to actually get insights, having a good user experience. 
But let's think about something a little bit differently. So instead of just talking about content in general, like what type of content is going to generate revenue for most B2B SaaS companies? It's going to be bottom of the funnel content. And like I said, the topics are going to be very similar for pretty much any B2B SaaS company. It's going to be best category software, best competitor alternatives, how to solve X pain point, some template. And those like best software topics and those best competitor alternatives, dude, that content is, it's probably the, from an SEO and like conversion perspective, it's the most important. It's going to generate the majority of your Agreed. customers from search. But dude, that content is so boring to create, it requires so much research and it's really hard to be unique. And if you do go the route, which you should, having actually unique insights that are based on maybe an expert that has experience with the software or your own, if you were actually reviewing each software, it's going to take a long time. Like I have my own process of how we go really in depth with each review and that process has been pretty successful, but yeah, the user experience as far as formatting, like we use the same template over and over again, but the insights that you have in the content takes a really long time. And I'm not quite sure if that's answering your UX question, but that's something I wanted to touch on a little bit is how to actually improve the user experience and your content that's actually going to be most important to your company, which is that bottom of the funnel stuff. Yeah. And I am glad you brought that up too, because my question was pretty broad about like UX and content, but I like that you took it a step further and said, this is how you apply the UX to the content that actually is going to convert for you. Cause I feel like for those like best category articles and alternatives, like almost always, it's just going to be like whatever company you're also listing. It's just going to be like a rehash of like their about page or like LinkedIn company page. Like I like that you actually take the additional step to get insights on that specific product that you can include there, where it's not just like generic information that you're plugging in and just only promoting your product is like the, the best option. And I think that's something that I, from what the category content that I've seen, like if you're doing a roundup on like the best project management software, like that's not an opportunity for you to like shit on the other products that are in that list. Like you, you called it a best of list for a reason. So I think if you can actually like come away with like insights and positive, like reasons to be using that tool, it just only makes your, your content like worth reading. Yeah. So basically if you're listening to this, if you don't already have blog posts on targeting like best category software keywords, you need to do that. Be warned though. It's going to be really, mind numbing to create because it's going to be very repetitive, but still going to be important. But I'll give a few tips on how I like to outdo my competitors with it. I'll try to give you a few simple tips. I'm not saying they're going to be simple to execute. They're going to take some time. Like one, if you're reviewing like PLG competitors that have free trials, sign up for the free trials, poke around their tool, try to use some features, see if you can catch any problems or you can develop your own opinion on it. That way you can actually talk from personal experience in your product reviews and ex instead of just like saying, like you said, rehashing whatever's on their about page, which sometimes if your competitors don't have free trials, you're not going to have that luxury, unfortunately, unless you know customers that do have experience, at, experience with that software that you can talk about. Second thing you need to do is basically this is going to might drive people nuts but I like to re read every single customer review from that software from the past year. And I take notes on all the pros and cons people mention and the cons, I make sure that I try to verify that it's actually true because sometimes customers just don't know what they're doing. And then they'll say, this software doesn't have this feature and you want to be honest, right? Like you said, you don't want to just poop on your competitors and talk bad about them. There's pros and cons to every company. There's cons to your company. You want to be fair and transparent about that with your competitors. If you are going to mention a con, definitely make confirm that it's true first. So there's that. And the one thing that I will say that a lot of SEO people, it's pretty easy to add to this type of content. They can make it a lot better is actually demo videos and more screenshots of like how the software works. So people can actually get a feel for the product. And usually when we update our 
client's content with these changes, the conversion rate increases too. And obviously that's kind of hard to measure why, but I think it's pretty safe to assume it's just because you're not just talking about your product, you're actually showing what it can do as well. And then your formatting is also really important, which I have a template for that. I don't want to plug it, but basically- Go for it. <laughs> all right, you know, thanks for your permission on this. So I'll give you the quick summary of the template. Don't, for the most part, for most companies, don't start it with what is category software. People that are looking for software are likely- Oh, I hate those. Content. They don't need to know what the software is. So don't talk to your, try to meet your audience where they're actually at and don't just try including what is software just because you're trying to rank for another keyword. That's really stupid and a waste of time. Get right to the competitors as quickly as possible. Maybe in the intro, keep it short. Maybe mention the pain points that someone's trying to solve with the software, but get to the point, get to the competitors. Position yourself. Give a re If you're putting yourself as number one, have a reason why you're putting yourself as number one. Just don't splat yourself at the top and have no good reason why. And then I'm going to give you some subheadings that I like to do with my clients. It'd be actually interesting to hear how you do this as well. But usually we try to aim for nine to 11 companies to compare our clients to. It's just usually what we've, I haven't like split tested it by any means, but for the most part, that seems what's been able to rank the best for us. And then we have the H2s for all the competitors, our clients, all the software options, and then pros, cons, features, pricing, and customer reviews. Sounds like a lot, Interesting, but that's how I do it. And then at the bottom, we add FAQs. I don't, you can make your FAQ helpful, but I still feel like FAQs are still being used in a way that we're just doing it to check a box, SEO box, just cause it kind of works to be honest, which I'll admit that. But what do you think of that process? And I'd be curious to hear what you're actually doing for bottom of the funnel content. Yeah, so I would say my process is pretty similar to, to, well, I guess my outline is pretty similar to what you guys are creating. I do like the addition of the customer reviews because I think how I do it, it's usually same thing. Like it will mention a competitor, it will mention the pros, it will mention the cons, the features, and then pricing. But I think it's, it's also interesting if you can plug in actual like customer reviews to say, this is what people are actively saying about this product. I totally agree about the the section about like having a generic, like what is section before you even get into anything. Like in my opinion, if you're reading an article that has like a, what is like blank software, it completely takes me out of that article. Like I already know what I'm looking for. Like, I don't need you to tell me what it exactly is. So to your point and what you said before about like satisfying that search intent, like First thing, what people are coming for on that page is to see different competitors or different people within that market. So show it to them as soon as you can. And then, I mean, they call it the inverted pyramid, like having the most important information at the top, and then you use the bottom to really like get into more of the meat that you were talking about. And I think the FAQs can be worthwhile. Like I think most people, and I, this is what you said too, like they get too hung up about like using people also asked to like plug in an FAQ and that's like their checkbox with like, okay, we did this. But I think if you can actually make the FAQs helpful, I would definitely recommend going for it. Like maybe not like what is software, but like if you do a section, like how does this software work or why should you be using the software? Like what are the benefits of using the software? I think if you can use it in a way where maybe it will help with your SEO, but really it's going to be helpful to the person actively reading that article, I'd say go for it. But if you're just including it as a reason to like basically like check off a box on your marketing or SEO list, then it's just, I, I would just avoid it. Anything that's going to dilute the content of the page and just like take away from the actual like education or the value you're providing to the reader. It's just, honestly, it's just, it's, in my opinion, it's just fat that just needs to be trimmed. Yeah. That might be a good word for it. Maybe we could start calling it like SEO fat and content or something. <laughs> where people are just trying no, to that's a, that's a good rank way. for worthless keywords. But I will say one tip with the FAQ, if you're actually trying to create a valuable FAQ for one of these best category software topics or best competitor alternatives, one of the questions that we ask when we onboard clients is what are the most, what are some common questions that customers ask you guys about your product? And you get to hear those questions and how they answer those. And you can actually include that in your FAQ. Like it might be like, how do I migrate from this newsletter platform to this one? How available is your customer support and stuff like this? People that 
these are questions that people care about because they're actually asking them. It's not just something that Google generated or Google's showing the people also ask section because some SEO person used some AI tool to generate an FAQ and then Google's just like showing on the people also ask section because there's nothing better else out there. That would be my one tip with FAQs, but that was actually a really good point of not making it too SEO fatty and worthless. Cut the fat. I like that. And I, I will I will say too, especially about your point with FAQs, I was working with a client recently who's building out a few product pages on their new website. And they asked me if I could generate, like help them find FAQs to use for their product. And some of the ones that they were recommending were just like so obviously like SEO focused. And especially on a product page where the point is to educate the person, look like researching your product on what they need to know about that product. So if you're like doing a product page on like, supply chain software, if you're doing, like, if you have an FAQ, like, what is demand planning? That's not going to help the person who's actively researching that product. Like, I, I feel like in that case, especially with a product page where it's more UX focused than SEO focused, you're much better off, like, pulling those answer or questions internally rather than going to Google and just kind of finding it that way. Yeah, I like that. One thing that I did forget to say, it's like a very important part about user experience that's easy to over and overlook. It's kind of hard to teach and learn. It's just, it's kind of an art, which is writing. Obviously we have to do a lot of writing in SEO. We're trying to rank for keywords. And yeah, we gave some tips of things that you could check off your box and be like, great, I did that. But writing is another thing. You could check off all these boxes and you could have this big, you can write very fluff, very fluffily. That's not a word, but I'm gonna use it anyways. And you could take a long time to get to the point and your writing could just not sound that good. And that's going to turn people away from your content as well. So hopefully you're a good writer. If you're writing this content yourself, if not find a good writer, which we could give some writing tips too as well. Cause I think writing is a huge part of SEO and just marketing in general. Like, are you kidding me? Like how you say something is True. super important. If you want to persuade people to take action, finding a good writer is really hard. And SEO, a lot of SEO agencies don't even have good writers. That's why they're one of the reasons that their content might not be that great. But even like my agency, we're very content focused and I work with a lot of freelance writers and finding good writers that can actually write clearly, concisely, but also not extremely dry and they understand marketing they understand how they should structure articles it's really hard to find and that is another reason why if you're also a good writer you can also easily beat most of your competitors because dude i mean i'll just talk about hubspot really quick but i never read a hubspot article because i don't if you're a hubspot writer i'm not saying this is directed towards you if you're watching this but i haven't read a hubspot article in years so take this with a grain of salt but a lot of the content's just like dry it's like reading an encyclopedia i was like who wants to read this and when i'm when i had some clients that were competing with some hubspot pages felt like it was actually pretty easy to beat them as far as content quality goes and even rankings because it was just easier to write more engaging copy because we're not writing like an encyclopedia what do you think of how writing plays a role in UX. So, I mean, especially with the HubSpot example, I think they're kind of an interesting case because they're, I mean, they were the ones that coined the term inbound marketing. So I guess that's like their whole playbook there. And they're so focused yeah. on just scaling to the maximum output, like getting as much content out there as possible, regardless of quality. And don't get me wrong, like there are good HubSpot articles that I enjoy reading, but it's not like my source for information. Like I, if I see an article that they have like dedicated to a keyword, like I'm not going to seek them out to, to read it. But I will say from Ahrefs, which honestly, I always use this as my example for the ideal company doing content marketing, right? Like no matter where they're ranking for a specific keyword, I will always actively seek them out. They could be like, position 10 or position nine, I know that content is always going to be quality, always going to be packed with like valuable information. So I know if it's uh, HubSpot in position one and Ahrefs in position nine, I'm almost always going to go to position nine for Ahrefs. I rather, because I think that's the thing that people are neglecting when it comes to brand building and not just SEO. It really doesn't matter where you're ranking. If you actually have like a reputable brand and people actually engage, like engaging with their brand, they're going to seek you out more often than just 
the company that's ranking in position one for generic content. And that's, I mean, the brand is really something you want to have. Like that should be your end goal to have people that want to come back to read more of your content, not just to have that content there in the first place, which a lot of people get hung up on. Yeah. SEO people love Ahrefs content, but they definitely deserve it. Like, right, the Ahrefs blog and the Backlinko blog, that's pretty much how I learned SEO. And I think the reason that why I liked it so much, just like you, is one, they're actually showing real examples and they're talking about SEO from their perspective and experience, which that's unique. It's not just regurgitating BS. And then they also make it really easy to read their content too. Like their copies really easy to read. It's concise and it's to the point. I think that goes a long way. It sounds so simple, but just having the ability to write concisely and clearly goes a long way when it comes to creating content, because I know from experience, most writers, I'll say, they don't know how to write as concisely as possible. And it makes the writing a lot harder to get through, which Ahrefs obviously does a great job with their copy along with their insights. And I'll also say too, especially with like, I think we touched on this earlier, but with like companies only creating SEO content, like the only metric they usually use is, okay, is this content actually driving clicks? And when you're only using clicks, you don't really know what's coming after that click. Did they read your article? Did they navigate your site? Did it lead to a demo? I mean, obviously most people will track the actual end goal, but I think a lot of people get too hung up on just the clicks itself and not if people are actively like engaging with that content. Are they actively like reading what we're we're creating versus just uh, landing on the page and just getting the traffic in the first place? Right. Yeah, I like that tip. I do. I do have another question that I'll probably want to jump into too, because we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but you also talked about like your process for of revamping older content. Just, it could either be bottom of funnel, middle of funnel, whatever opportunity you find. So I guess the question that I have here is one, how do you find those opportunities? And then two, once you find those opportunities, how do you go after them? Yeah, this gets me really excited to talk about this. So like blog revamping, it's nothing new, but it's something for the past year and a half, I've been really starting to focus on and I can give a little bit of backstory there, but I don't want this to go too long. Basically SEO is notorious for taking too long. And if you're a tech company on a strapped budget, you're not going to want to invest on something that's going to take a really long time to get customers. So that was my skill SEO and content. What was the best way for me to get my clients results, get them customers without them having to wait? 12 months. And with any marketing thing, it's going to be working with what you already have. So basically the gist of blog revamping is when you have an old URL and you update it, old page, you update it, which I'll get into the nuance of that in a second. Google will rank it a lot faster, which I don't know the exact reason why I'll speculate. That's just because the URL has a history and because it's older, it's more trusted in the eyes of Google. So it doesn't have to like start Basically, you're a trusted source is what I'm trying to say, or trusted source, because technically it is a tactic. I will say that. But if you combine this tactic with actually creating good content, that is the best on Google. You're going to have a lot of success with it. So I'll give you my process now. We already talked about the bottom of the funnel content is where pretty much most of your content efforts should be, unless you have like a huge budget and you can start going after other things and Maybe you want to capture emails or other KPIs you might care about. But for the most part, the small SaaS company, they should be doing bottom of the funnel because that's going to generate customers. So what I do when I have a prospect, a new prospect come in, I'll see one, do they already have old content? If they don't, then you guys start from scratch anyways, because there's nothing you can do about that. But if they do have a bunch of old content, what I do is I go through their blog and their landing pages. Well, I kind of have to go through the landing pages first. I have to figure out what their software actually is, who it helps, what industry they're in, what integrations are important to their customer customers. Those things you can usually figure out from their website. But then I'll search their blog and look for best software blog posts or best competitor alternatives blog posts, comparisons, competitor comparisons blog posts, how-to blog posts. They're just targeting a bottom of the final keyword, but it doesn't even have the right angle. Like you need a best category software blog post, but a lot of these companies that don't know what they're doing, they'll have a blog post about like 
why you need a restaurant yeah. POS system. It's like nobody is really searching for this. And even if they are, the chances of them buying aren't as high as if they're actually looking for solutions. So one, it's not going to rank for the most part. Second, it's not really built for conversion either. So I'll find these bottom of the funnel topics, which we already talked about what those were. And then we'll find ways. I'll do some searches. I'll see, I'll basically make a list of everything that the competitors are doing that this client has not done that's making their content, the competitor's content is better. Let me rephrase that. The reason why that competitor is ranking and our client's not, I jot all, every single reason down. I have this big checklist that I go through and I get really nitpicky. And you can do that. That's kind of syst, uh, a system you can use. Usually that takes care of most of the work. But if you understand your customers, you can also just look at a post and be like, understand how this could be better as well. Like maybe it needs more expert insights. Maybe it needs to be reformatted to get to the point quicker. Jot all those reasons down. And then we go through the process of creating the better article. And a lot of times there's some simple mistakes, which dude, that checklist is so long. I don't want to get into it too much, but I definitely can if you want to. But basically update the content, make sure it's the best damn thing on Google. Submit it to Search Console. Make sure you're, you, you're tracking where your ranks are just so you have like a benchmark and there's some important things in the checklist, but basically you can rank super fast this way. And if you're actually targeting in these important keywords that are relevant to your product and you do a good job of positioning your product inside the blog post, you're going to increase your conversion rate a lot. And if it's the right keyword, you can get a lot of customers from it. That was kind of an overview, which might've not been that helpful, but there's so many different things that, we do when we're updating content that I didn't want to like give an hour speech about it. But if you have any questions, well, let me know. I guess the next question might get into a little bit more specifics, but I know you, we talked before this podcast that you had a case study that you wanted to talk about. Did you mention that this case study was also from like a blog revamping project? Yeah. So one of the blog and the, one of the case studies I have on my blog and my website, statdigital.io is a blog revamp case study. So I started talking about this a lot once I started focusing on it. And one of my clients really needed it. They had, they've been publishing pretty much mass publishing content since like the early 2010s. So they had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of blog posts and they had hundreds of thousands of monthly clicks when I first started working with them. But as I was working with them, I realized a lot of the traffic that they're getting was completely worthless because it'd be like targeting like sexiest Instagram users and they'd have a blog post that like the sexiest Instagram users. And I was like, it gets a crap ton of clicks, which looks sexy on your traffic graph that you're going to share on LinkedIn and brag about, yes. but not generating any customers. They actually had very little bottom of the funnel content, but they had some topics where they're kind of targeting a keyword and we were able to reposition that to be more focused on their product and match search intent better. And then we basically with that client, we identified the most important topics for them, which is like best category software for each of their industries. we created those pages for them and we identified those, created it. And at that point they have a limited budget. So we don't create a bunch of more content just for the sake of it. What I recommended to that client was to just, let's just focus on these important blog posts that we know are going to drive signups. And basically we have this master list of these important bottom of the funnel blog posts and we're just updated, continuously updating it. It's an ongoing process, but that's what my case study is about. I think, especially with most companies that I come across, all of them are focused on like creating new content. Like they never take a second to pull themselves back and focus on what we should act actively like update on our website. Like what existing assets can we update that can lead to quick wins? So I feel like, I mean, you said it yourself too. If you're creating an entirely new article with insights and everything else that you need to include, that's going to take like multiple hours of your time to create something entirely fresh. Whereas if you can identify an existing topic on your website, not only is it going to take you less time to update that article, but you're likely going to see your results come in faster compared to just creating something entirely new that you have to kind of build up rankings for. So I think 
overall, it's just a, it's just a better way to approach how you go about content marketing. I mean, yeah, you still probably want to go after like new topics if you find that they would be valuable to your business. But if you have those existing topics on your website, that would be worthwhile with conversions and it's not ranking for anything, might as well update it. I mean, you could either update it, you could delete it, you can merge it into another article, whatever you do, just at least make sure that article is the best it can possibly be. Yeah. I really get sick, which there's some peers that I have on LinkedIn. I doubt that they will watch this. Maybe they will. I think you might, you're probably, I hope they do. Your time <laughs> but a lot of our SEO peers, I'll say some of them have this philosophy that you need to like mass publish, like dozens of blog posts every month. Month. I think that's kind yeah. of truth to it in the past, but for most companies, I think it's a complete waste of money and a complete waste of time. You probably have like, depending on the company, right? But you probably have like, I know well under a hundred, like really important blog posts that you could create that are going to do have high conversion rates. You should really just focus on the most important ones, make sure they're the best. You're going to publish this content. And even if you do a good job, it ranks number one. You get customers from it. Eventually, it's going to decay just because your competitors are putting out content. And what's going to happen with time, if you're just constantly publishing new content, is your old content is going to start going down the rankings. So you'll get less clicks. And less people are going to be signing up to your product from SEO. So it needs to be built into your co content uh, process and strategy. It's an ongoing thing. You really need to do it continuously, probably every month after you've covered all of your core pieces of content that you need, that's going to drive conversions. And basically you can monitor, you probably, you're a big search console guy, which I love search console too. <laughs> that's a good way of finding out if your content's decaying. My new favorite way is just having a rank tracker, which I use prank tracker and rankings like it's it can be a vanity metric because we've all seen like these freelance writers brag about ranking for a keyword but it's like a huge long tail keyword it's like of course you're going to rank number one for that because no one's actually searching for that but keyword ranking for the right keywords is one of the most important things that you can do because for rankings let me think about that for a second to get conversions you need traffic to get traffic you need people seeing your post on Google. And for that to happen, you need to actually show up and rank. So that's why rankings are actually important. <laughs> and that's how you monitor content decay. That's how I like to do it. That's so funny. That's literally word for word. What's on my, like when I do SEO audits, like that's <laughs> literally word for word, how I phrase it too. I go rankings, visibility, traffic conversions. You're definitely on the right track there. Yeah. It should be just like a, <laughs> a moto or maybe something we should get tattooed on us. I don't actually like tattoos, yeah. but would be funny. But I think that's, that's something that, I mean, honestly, when I see it on LinkedIn and I mean, for two things, like whenever I see people posting about rankings or I see them posting about traffic, like it never really tells us, okay, was there anything that actually came from that traffic? Was that traffic actually worth going after in the first place? Cause I could work with any website and like double their traffic for like random keywords. But at the end of the day, are those keywords actually going to generate business for us? So I think that's always something I try to take into consideration. Like when I see those like insane case studies on LinkedIn, it's like, what were the actual results from this project? And one example that I will give too, I mean, this is probably the most extreme example, but do you know who Jake Ward is on LinkedIn? Like a yeah. big, he owns, co-owns Byword, I think. Yeah. He I had that one. Not much anymore, but I know who he is. Yeah. I mean, he had that one case study on like how he used his competitors sitemaps to like AI generate like a bunch of pages across his website. And of course the initial case study was like, like they, I think he scaled the website to like a million and under like six months, something crazy like that. The case study completely blew up. But if you check where that website's at currently, the website actually got hit with the manual penalty by Google and still has not recovered. So all of that traffic that they gained with that quick win tool is just was completely wiped out. And even before they start working on that project, all of that traffic is gone. So I think that's always something to keep in mind. I mean, that's probably the most extreme example that I do have, but just whenever you do see a case study on LinkedIn, just try to think beyond just the rankings and the actual traffic that they're showing. Like, it, it, like think, is this actually something that brought value to that client? Whereas not just, oh, they scaled traffic by 20 or 200%. Yeah. 
it can, it can turn into a vanity metric. Honestly, now that I think of it, someone flexing traffic, I think that could be more of a vanity metric than ranking for a very specific keyword, just because you're going to know the intent better. And intents, like, honestly, it's probably the most important factor that's going to impact your conversions because you're actually getting targeted traffic. But yeah, I see what you're saying. Nothing against Jake Ward. I don't know him too well, but it did warm my heart a little bit hearing about that his website getting hit with that penalty <laughs> just because we don't need any more garbage content on the internet. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I mean, I actually like Jake, like I've talked with him a few times and I've, I've mostly just known him from LinkedIn, but from that case study alone, like it blew up throughout the whole website. Like he had like HubSpot covering him. If you actually go on Reddit, it's pretty, pretty terrible, but like he was actively getting like death threats by people that were pissed off about his case study just like spamming the web with AI content. And I mean, I I disagree with what the case study was showing, but like, I also disagree that you should be like sending this guy death threats based on what he's actively doing. Like what he was doing does not reflect him as a person. So that was a whole like crazy situation. Yeah. I mean, if you wanted to do something about it, you can just always tweet uh, John Mueller, but I probably (laughs) wouldn't recommend that either because it might get you on there. So I guess... It looks like we are kind of running out of time here. So I probably will leave off on one last question that I wanted to ask you. So you post pretty frequently on LinkedIn, but I I probably will end up asking most of my guests this, but I just want to know, like, what was the initial inspiration for getting started on LinkedIn? Like what was kind of like that first trigger where you were like, oh, maybe I should start posting on LinkedIn and educating my audience. Right. It was on my mind for a few years because I was mainly getting clients through Upwork and I did some cold email went well, but having inbound, it's a lot better than outbound as far as lead quality goes. And one day I had someone book a meeting with me. I assumed it came in from Upwork or I don't know, maybe it was an old prospect. Then I looked into it and this perfect fit B2B SaaS company found me through LinkedIn just because I had my profile somewhat optimized for what I do. They found me, booked a meeting with me. They're still my client today. This was like shit it's been a really long time it's been i think over two years and that motivated me i'm like shit i got a really good client from linkedin and i didn't even try imagine if i actually tried at linkedin i could probably kill it on linkedin so then i started i was lurking for a while and i saw some people killing it on linkedin so i thought and then i ended up buying a social selling course from let me make sure i get their names right I don't want to butcher them because they did help me. <laughs> Morgan Smith and Nicholas Thicket. They don't do, I don't think they do too much social selling stuff anymore, but they had this program, part of their B2B Power Hour, which was a podcast thing where they'd give social selling tips. But they had a course. I bought it. That kind of gave me a good head start on LinkedIn. But man, LinkedIn has been a journey and it definitely was not. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm not super successful on LinkedIn. I'm not going to pretend I am. It's helped my business a lot. And it's definitely picked up a lot, but uh, yeah, dude, it took me uh, pretty much a year to get my first inbound lead from LinkedIn. And I was posting, I wasn't extremely consistent, but I was definitely posting every week. There's some times where I'd post every day, but now I've, I'm kind of chilling at two posts per week just so I can stay top of mind. And I would like to do more. I need to free up my time a little bit more to do so though. Yeah, I'm, I've actually scaled myself down because I, for a while now, I've been posting five times per week, like almost every work day. One, I think people probably got tired of seeing me, like seeing me post every single day. So I also scaled down to three posts per week. And kind of like you said, I think it's better to, instead of like feel like you're posting just to post, you can actually, when you're posting three times a week, you can actually make sure that those th- three posts are going to be the best things that you can put out. So you can actually ensure that the quality is going to be much higher than just going for quantity over quality. I will say too, I feel like I I get caught up on this all the time. I'm sure you probably do too, is like seeing all of these different like LinkedIn accounts that are like blowing up in terms of engagement and you look at their posts and it's like the most like generic thing you could write on SEO. And I think you, you do a pretty good job at this. It's just not getting caught up in like just like engagement metrics, like not posting to get engagement. Like you actually are posting to put value out there. And like the content that you are putting out is like actually helpful and actionable information. Whereas I think with the majority of LinkedIn, a lot of it is just like fluff. Like people just try, it's kind of like an example of like 
like a business leader trying to be the loudest person in the room to get the recognition. Like that's how it feels sometimes, but I always have an extra sense of appreciation for the people that put in extra, extra effort with their content. And it's not just posting for the sake of it. You, you might send me on another rant. I could rant about LinkedIn. Most of the content <laughs> is fluffy bullshit and it's just generic advice. And the thing that really pisses me off about, I know most of the time it's, we're in SaaS and SEO marketing stuff. So those are the main accounts that we see. A lot of gurus, we'll use that term, they give you all this, they create all these posts about how to do something, but they're never actually showing themselves doing it. And that just comes oh, yeah. off as really inauthentic to me. It's like, how do I know if you're actually being successful with what you're doing, if you're not actually showing us results? So I do like your point about cutting down on volume if it helps you create high quality, higher quality content. And I don't do it all the time, but I try to post stuff that I think is going to be valuable to my business and value to my ICP and something that's going to actually be original and unique, not something that's like, I don't know, in, insert any like how to do SEO, something that Moz has an article on that people have known about for years. Try to stay away from that stuff. Although if you have a unique twist, that's definitely one way to make it unique. I totally agree with you. Dude. Don't engagement is BS because it's the quality of the engagement is a better factor. Like there's a lot of these sure. content marketing influencers and SEO influencers. They get like hundreds of likes, but if you click on who's liking it and you'll see it's pretty low quality it's like freelancers and stuff, which nothing wrong with your freelancer, but we're not selling to freelancers. We're selling to marketing leaders. So I really doubt how effective that is for them. And I know personally from other people I've talked about, a lot of these people that seem like they're doing really well on LinkedIn, especially with these fluffy audiences, they're not actually doing that well in business. So, and there's plenty of people who are killing it in business that you don't even know about because they don't have time to post on LinkedIn, but we do it for marketing. So that's sure. a little different. I'd like that point of yours. Don't get caught up in the engagement. And I'll say one example that relates to that. Like one of the most recent leads I had came in, I posted, I thought the post was pretty good. Wasn't the best post ever. It got nine likes, which was like the lowest engaged post I had in like a pretty long time, which I don't get crazy likes, but that's even low for me. And I didn't let it get to me too much. But then like a day later, this SaaS founder of like this 50 employee company booked a meeting with me after reading that post. I was like, that's try not to curse, but that's freaking crazy, man. Like nine people <laughs> like the post and a really qualified lead came in. They're probably going to close too. And that just goes against like what everyone thinks. Like they think that you need to be like getting hundreds of likes to be getting business from LinkedIn. But I've gotten clients from my somewhat small audience. So it's really more about the focus and quality. That's funny. You mentioned the, the nine likes too, because I, I was just about to add that I had an example where I had like a 10 like like only 10 people liked one of my posts. And that actually ended up bringing or getting me my highest paying client to date. And uh, at the time when I post, when I posted it, I was like, this is like, what's happening with my engagement? Like my posts are like sucking. And then I have that coming. I'm like, oh, okay. Maybe actually, maybe I should keep doing this. But no, I think that's a good piece of advice. Like really it's not always going to be the high performing pages or the high engagement articles, or I don't know, I'm saying articles, posts that are going to get you leads. It's going to be the posts that actually resonate with your audience. So I think that's a better way of looking at it. Like focus on your, what they want to see versus what do the mass masses want to see. Amen to that. That's changed my perspective <laughs> a lot. Who LinkedIn's definitely interesting topic. Yeah. Could be, that could be uh, a whole other podcast. Yeah, exactly which I could get into it more, but I'll let you take the wheel. Sure. Well, I think we're coming to the end of our time. So maybe we could schedule that as the, another podcast just on LinkedIn. But anyways, I just wanted to thank you, man, for, for coming on this first episode. Really appreciate you taking the time. Really appreciate you allowing me to, to test this thing out. And I think this has been a pretty solid talk so far. So I really appreciate you coming on for this. Really appreciate it too, Taylor. It's seriously a pleasure and an honor to be your first guest. Thanks again, man. Appreciate it.